All right, Tiff, do you want to get started? Great. Kia ora, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, uh, Celebrating Women in Organics. I'm Tiffany Tompkins from Organics Aotearoa, New Zealand. And for today's session, I'm joined by my co-host, Viv Williams. Viv, can you give us a little wave? There she is. Um, many of you will recognize Viv. She was previously the CEO of Owens and currently sits on Owens Advisory Board. She's had a career across business and government, and she's been an incredible, incredible mentor to me and jumps in to help the organic sector to meet strategic goals when we need her most. So thank you, Viv, for joining us today. Uh, just quickly before we get started, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we'll be online for an hour, so and we're recording the session, so please keep yourself <coughs> muted um, and be sure to pop any comments or questions in the chat. Lou Vicente over here, Lou, say hi. Our marketing and comms manager will make sure that uh, your questions are answered. So today we are talking to three incredible women leaders in Aotearoa's organic sector. With International Women's Day being celebrated um, across the world last week, we thought it'd be a great idea to bring in the stories of incredible women working in organics here in Aotearoa. So today we're speaking with Jenny Lux, who's the director and head gardener of Lux Organics. Jenny is an ecologist and founder of Rotorooter's first organic market garden, and she's on the board of Soil and Health, uh, BioGrow, and Organic Farm NZ. So Jenny, welcome. Thanks for being here. We're also talking to Molly Callahan from uh, the director of Root Shoots and Fruits, um, which produces organic fertilizers and plant nutritional products to farmers, growers, and home gardeners. Uh, amazing, amazing products. Molly has been a trusted advisor on the nutritional needs of plants for commercial growers and farmers for over 20 years. So kia ora, Molly. Thank you. And Sarah Hedger is the chef and founder of Yum Granola based in Nelson. This is a product that is a staple in my family's pantry. Um, Yum's organic granola can be found across New Zealand. And Sarah is a sustainable food entrepreneur that has been defending brands in supermarkets, which I hope we'll be able to talk about in a little bit too. So thank you, Sarah, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So unfortunately today, um, our friend Anna Flower Day, who we're hoping to be here, is wasn't available. Um, she's from Te Whareira Wines in Blenheim, and it's a beautiful day here in Marlborough, which means that it is all hands on deck during harvest. So Anna and her team, we wish you a smooth, no drama, successful harvest this season and are looking forward to tasting vintage 2023. But I'd like to start off by asking the three panelists to, to introduce themselves. Um, and then we'll go from there and Viv and I will ask, we'll take turns asking our panelists some questions and then we'll get into a little bit of a panel discussion. So Molly, can you please start us off by introducing yourself? Okay, thank you. I'm Molly and um, yeah, thanks for inviting me today into everyone's lunchroom by the sounds. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm, I'm the owner and director of a company called Root Shoots and Fruits. It's an agricultural company that supports New Zealand growers in producing quality production. Uh, we utilise biological organisms and plant nutrition. So essentially we're endeavouring to remove the need to use chemicals from the food chain and whilst helping growers to produce nutrient dense food and well, of course, wine even though Anna's not here. <laughs> so we all like a drop. Um, so my dad, he inspired me to start our business. He was a farmer and he was quite an out of the box thinker. He used biotechnologies and, you know, different technologies like 50 years ago and things. He was an early adopter of things like spray irrigation. And we used ladybirds um, for our export loosened hay um, and other biological organisms way back then like trichodermas. So he was an inspiration, I suppose, and organic growing was really just a way of life for us. So I've always had a desire to keep it that way. Um, I believe that the passion is still instilled in the core of our business. And, you know, we love sharing knowledge and providing certified organic products. And we have done since the inception of our, um, our business, Root Shoots and Fruits. 
Um, and I think the, the thing now is that I actually believe it's a really critical time now that we need to have change on farms in the way we produce. So, yeah, thank you for inviting me here today and hopefully we can inspire some people. Great. Thank you, Molly. That great introduction. And um, yes, I agree. We are here to, uh, to help change the way that we are um, the, the majority of farms are being produced and um, we're very excited to, um, to have you aboard here and for your products. They're, I can't wait to dive into that a little bit later as well. Uh, Sarah, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hello. My name is Sarah Hedger. I am, um, as you can probably hear, I'm originally from California and I've been living in New Zealand for 13 years. I am a chef. Um, I'm the founder of Yum Granola based here in Nelson. Um, Yum offers sustainable breakfast options that look after the planet. Um, we're known for having quite unwavering values and um, being staunch in our ways with um, with this, I guess, with regards to sustainability. Um, we're innovative as well in, in a lot of ways. And um, yeah, and we just really believe in delivering high quality and, and with that, um, we have been organic and using organic ingredients since the very beginning, because to us, there's there's no reason that organic ingredients shouldn't be mainstream. And and it's just in alignment with our values. So um, super important to us. I started Yum! in Wanaka about eight years ago. Um, it's, it's really evolved with us. It's like having an eight-year-old eight child <laughs> and um, always kind of upset, undulating. And um, yeah, and it's been quite a, quite a good journey. And um, yeah, I was just really inspired to make a high quality product that, that didn't have chemicals and pesticides and preservatives in it. I just believe ultimately that should be mainstream and that should be the quality that everyone deserves to have on the shelf. So thanks a lot for inviting me as well. Oh, thanks, Sarah. That's awesome introduction too. And if you haven't tried Yum, uh, you need to get to your local grocery store and or you know organic market um, and and grab a box because it is amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, thanks. And, and Jenny, can you please introduce yourself? Yoda Tato. Um, I feel really honored to be amongst such esteemed company, um, Molly, Sarah, and. And everyone else that's here, um, some people who I recognize from my past, hi Ruth, and some people who I've worked with and who and um, have been advisors to me. So it's a it's a real honor to be presenting. Um, I I'm from a small organic market garden in Rotorua, which we started seven years ago. Um, that's evol evolved into um, some work in the organic sector, volunteering for various organizations and. Um, I, I guess uh, you'll hear a bit more about what we do um, later on, but essentially we're part of the local food movement. Um, so it, it's what we do locally, but it's also about, um, I guess, a trend and something uh, that we do to, to solve some of the world's most wicked problems, uh, all of which can be solved um, in local ways. So, yeah. Good, thanks, Jenny. I actually want to kick us off with a question to you, Jenny. Um, we're going to go back and forth with a few questions and, um, and, and then we'll get into a discussion, but you're on the board of BioGrow, you're on the board of Organic Farm and Zed, you're on the board of Soil and Health Association, you're running your own business, you have your own farm, you're an organic advocate, you have such a wealth of experience from all these different angles. So can you tell us like how you ended up on this path? Sure. Um, well, I still feel like I'm relatively new uh, to the organic sector, actually. So I have some experience, <laughs> but I certainly have my finger in a lot of pies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I started off studying biology at university and um, I was really interested in, in forest ecology. So that's the direction that I headed in. And most of my first jobs were field, field biology jobs, surveying vegetation, sometimes in forests, sometimes in Alpine areas, sometimes top of the mountains, sometimes, um, you know, even military training area vegetation. So I got lots of experience in botany. Um, and then I had some jobs overseas working with animals, um, sea turtles mainly. Uh, later on, I did a master's degree and I um, focused really, I went back to the plants and focused a lot on the 
the relationship, the statistical relationship between soil types and regeneration of forests. So I've always been interested in the ability of land to regenerate and how that happens in a natural way and what comes first and what comes next and what's the diversity there and what are the relationships. So um, I did have a, a, a consulting career for a few years doing that for a company um, to government and to private landowners and then then, you know, life advanced, um, motherhood came along and I got more senior. And then I found um, my job just became sitting at a desk a lot of the time and reviewing other people's fun work that they were doing out in the field. And I just thought, oh, maybe not, maybe not for me. Um, so I focused on motherhood full time for six years. And then I, then I started Lux Organics with my husband, Richard. And um, I also did an evening course in organic um, horticulture with Ruth McLean here, who's an absolute legend. So it's, um, I had some pretty important, um, you know, side swerves into agriculture from ecology um, by just having an interest in growing and then knowing I could meet a need in my local community there. Now, how did I get into all the advocacy stuff? Well, um, <laughs> shoulder tapping um, happened and um, I was like, well, maybe I could. And I, I always, have wanted to be I always have been a, a sort of an agitator when it comes to the environment so I thought well where can I contribute um this is very much still organics is still very much on the cusp of something in New Zealand it's not mainstream as Sarah has acknowledged and so more work needs to be done to get it out there and to support it happening and um soil and health's got a very proud and long history of doing that and Organic Farm New Zealand and BioGrow both spun out of soil and health in the past. So I guess it's um, me being present in all of those four at the moment just means that I'm recognizing that we're in a critical phase and I want the best uh, for all of the the whole uh, organic ecosystem, you know, in New Zealand. There's people in my scale and there's also large companies and there's suppliers like inputs, uh, suppliers like Molly's and there's uh, makers like Sarah who are producing products and it's a huge ecosystem that has potential to really grow and we want to get the the settings right for the organic products bill so that's why I'm doing all of this at the moment yeah that's awesome well we're very appreciative of all the amazing work that you do and yeah it's really great to have the diversity of women here today that represent different areas of the sector and that whole value chain so we appreciate that thanks Thanks so much, Jenny. All right, so the next, next question for Molly. Uh, so interesting, we were talking before about where all our speakers were from and they're all around New Zealand and quite a few people are living remotely. And Molly grew up remotely in Australia and I was really keen to ask her, how did this um, experience influence your entire career path? Mm, so, thanks, Liv. <laughs> Yes, I grew up on a little island, an idyllic little island in Australia. I have great memories of being on the farm and being immersed in nature, running around barefoot and, you know, just having a great life. It was a simple life, I suppose, as well. And, you know, we were surrounded by plants and trees and animals and pets of all type. I remember we had baby kangaroos and lizards and there were always plenty of snakes and whatever. Um, and so for me, you know, the natural world and growing sustainably has always been a part of my life. And um, Tim and myself, my husband, Tim, we wanted our children to have that type of a life and upbringing also. So, yeah, Tim's, farmer, um, Tim's family is also farmers. Um, and so it was really just a natural progression for us to sort of obviously go into agriculture. And, you know, my father being so out there in his thinking, I suppose, I think just made me aware when we did move to New Zealand that there were so many technologies and tools that weren't available to farmers here. And we just really wanted to help them become aware that there are, you know, life's moved on in technology for organics as well. Yeah, yeah. And why the move to New Zealand? Um, so we actually, we were living in, in Africa for a long period of time. Um, yeah, and for, I think we were there for like three years or so. And we wanted to come back to Tim's family. Um, his father had died of cancer. And so we were running family farms there. Um, yeah, and so that's how that's how we ended up coming back here. Yeah, great, great story. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Sarah, I have a question for you. I tell so you. you are a chef by trade. Um, how did you get into the business of breakfast? Well, um, it's interesting now because looking back, it seems very straightforward that I would end up nowhere else than in breakfast. Um, I guess I've had a long fascination with um, not just granola, but with breakfast and how that first meal of the day really sets you up for the whole day. So, you know, if you eat a balanced balanced meal in your macros, then, you know, you don't have the sugar ups and downs. And it was just kind of my, my own experiment with myself that I was drawn to breakfast. And then, um, ironically in California, I had never really had a granola that, um, that I could eat. They all always gave me a real bad stomach ache. And I would look at the ingredients and kind of not understand why all of these ingredients I could eat together independently, but when they were together in granola, it just would hurt me. And so, um, I was just determined, like I, I could come up with my own recipe and I'm going to do something where I know the ingredients are high quality and my body will digest and, and feel the long days that I had as a chef. So, um, yeah, it was really quite, um, I guess it was just in my, my ongoing passion and, um, insatiability for high quality ingredients and, and knowing how they can make us feel for the day. Um, yeah, so. Oops, you're on mute. I always do that. Sorry. <laughs> How does organic fit into that in terms of high quality ingredients and, and what things, you know, affecting your body? Um, yeah, I guess, mean? yeah. And I guess coming from the States, I feel like I've seen um, a scale of food production that we, we probably will never see in New Zealand. So, um, so I've been a believer of organics and the benefits of it yeah. to the climate, to the planet, to the people. And to me, there's no, there's no other way to do business. There's no other way to have a food production business than organic. So we would probably close the doors of yum before we would go traditional ingredients, unfortunately. Yeah. Just mainstream ingredients. So, well, I guess we're kind of leading the way. And for us, we do sacrifice our, our GP and our margins for it because it costs us a lot more to be in that space and, and to play in that mainstream space with the, the cost of organic ingredients. But um, yeah, again, there's just, it's just been with us since the very beginning. And, and as a chef to me, they, they taste far better as well. So it's kind of, um, it's a win-win for us and, and it's part of what makes yum so special. So we sell yum into, into three different channels in New Zealand. And, um, so we retail and e com and then the wholesale sector. And so, um, it's really interesting to see right now, which ones are, are most receptive to, you know, organic being mainstream and what they're getting with yum. So yeah, it's really, um, it's been quite interesting to us, but, but there's been no other way for us to do business and have yum. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Hey, Sarah, I've got a question from Joanne in the audience and she's asking you, do you struggle to find organic ingredients in New Zealand? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really great question. Um, it's super challenging. Um, it's not just organic ingredients in New Zealand, it's organic granola ingredients in New Zealand. So, um, when, when COVID first happened, you know, a few years ago, our, um, we didn't, you know, nobody knew what it was going to look like. And, and Mike, my husband and I were like, well, oh, if, you know, if shit really hits the fan and we have, we have no idea what we're going to do and we can't import ingredients, what are we going to do? And I was like, aha, at last, there's a reason to have hundred percent New Zealand grown granola. Like nothing excites me more than that, but to have all of those ingredients that were organic, that just, it's not an option. We're in a pretty small country with, um, <laughs> But when I say that on one side, but then we, we live in this incredible food bowl of a country where we should be able to produce just about everything, right? So um, I guess that's kind of where we're going with Yum. And as it grows, we want to, we want to have those relationships with the farmers that, that are growing organically and, and support them and be able to go to them and say, hey, we need this, we need organic sunflower seeds hold. Can you do that for us? You know, and, and that's kind of where we're going and what we look forward to doing but yeah it's very hard to find organic ingredients in new zealand yeah yeah all right, right. got um one back for jenny um so the question is you and your husband what were the values that you agreed on when you started lux organics and then i want to add a little bit extra for experts since you're an expert and where do you see those values taking your business in the future 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we started, we knew it was just going to be a local business because um, we've got a hectare and we're supplying Rotorua, which is 70,000, um, and there was plenty of demand. So we knew we would, but that's actually a value is, is to be local and, and we don't deliver um, other than a tiny bit to Tauranga because they're big us, but you know, like the, there's no um, out of town um deliveries we are, obviously we value organic so everything that that entails biodiversity um you know having a toxic toxicity free food chain um yeah you know what organic means but in addition to that we also um we want to minimize our carbon emissions from all other activities as well so not just in the way we grow but also we we probably think the first and maybe still the only uh, company in Rotorua that's delivering with a, an EV. We got our EV in 2017 and um, it's still going <laughs> and we're hoping that it will will one day be a battery for our house because I, he I hear they're doing trials on vehicle to, to grid uh, conversion tools. But anyway, we, we've uh, recently saved up and installed solar panels as to power our chiller and our van. Um, makes sense because the chiller operates most um, most strongly during the hot days and the van's parked here during the hot days. So everything that we set up is to minimize carbon emissions, to keep things local, to keep the food delicious and healthy and fresh. Uh, so we harvest the day before and we deliver it only 10 kilometers away or 12. Mm -hmm. um, so the value, and also I employ local people. That was a key thing. Um, I think you're going to burn out if you try and run your own business 24 seven all the time, you need someone to rely on so you can get away. For example, today, I was just telling the others we're, we're heading off to WOMAD for the weekend uh, with our kids. And that's a major achievement for a small business where you have daily watering to do and animals to look after and all the rest. So um, we have achieved the, the critical size where we can actually employ a couple of people and um, have them live on site and, and help us to run the business. So, and have some time off, you know, life balance. <laughs> um, how do I see it going into the future? Um, I would love to see a network of um, local food providers like we, like growers that we are. <clears throat> There's still not enough of them locally. Food still, it's still distributed too far, I think in many cases in New Zealand, especially the fresh food. We can see the vulnerabilities uh, of that in recent times. Um, communities need need local food growing as a knowledge and practice in every part, in every village, in every rural area, in every city fringe. We need to be producing food. So, um, and it's also important for for a, a human health and well being. Uh, you know, it's it's so good for people to be involved in that and to have jobs in that. Um, so, I I would hope that. Those values, because people are getting to be more aware of the importance of, of local and organic food, that, that we will always be able to get staff. Like we haven't had a problem so far, fingers crossed. <laughs> but every season we need live-in staff for, for about nine months. And, and usually they're knocking on my door first. Um, so keep the word out there, everyone. Um, working in local organic is fun and you eat really well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to continue going on and have that life balance where, which allows me to get out and do um, volunteer work and consulting and other things to help grow the sector. Jesus. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Molly, I have a question too, kind of going off of what Jenny's talking about in terms of you know community and the importance of community. I know that you, um, you, you've lived on Waiheke Island and it's a place that really attracts passionate people um, about organics and sustainable practices. And can you share how this community has inspired you and sort of the importance of community um, as, a, as a small business owner? Okay. Well, yeah, um, we've actually been living on Waiheke for 27 years now. So time's flying. <laughs> Um, and as I mentioned before, we came from Africa and moved back to New Zealand, living on a family farm. Um, but then Tim and I, myself, we decided to move to Waiheke and um, we started, um, it, it was something called the Conservation Corps. 
where we took young people who had fallen through the cracks really in life and we used conservation as a, as a vehicle to sort of bring back joy and meaning into their lives. So that's how we first came to Waiheke. And so back then, you know, there was a lot of hippies and I'm happy to <laughs> include myself in that umbrella. <laughs> so I think, you know, being quite close to Auckland, even though we were close, we were actually set apart from Auckland and Waiheke attracted different types of people with different types of thinking and ideas and, you know, people who just actually enjoyed a simple and natural life. Uh, but there were always really interesting people to meet and there still are. Um, I think the word organic never really was used. It's just really now that people sort of want to define themselves and, and their market and their beliefs more. And I think, you know, now that we're doing that, it attracts more like-minded people. And so we're actually growing and inspiring each other together, really, as a community. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right. So, um, Sarah, I asked Ginny where she thought she was going to take her business in the future. Where is Yum going? Mm. Where is Yum going? Oh gosh, even the driver can't see that sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, Yum is Yum is growing, which is amazing. Yum is stoked to be on the other side of COVID. Um, but I guess we get really excited because Yum is is going more mainstream, and and that's not in us wavering in our values. It's in um, people accepting that that yeah, organic ingredients and. Um, I guess that we, that we deserve to be on the shelf. And so, I don't know, it's, you know, it's hard to call yourself a leader, but when you look around and no one else is doing it, then you kind of realize you are. And um, it's great for us because it's a real point of difference, but it also makes me quite sad that no one else is doing it. And, you know, no one else has plant-based packaging and no one else is thinking about the long-term effects of, of what they're doing. And um yeah, so just to have Yum sustaining us as as a family and um, sustaining itself, and like we're not out to conquer the world, and we just want to serve people incredible breakfasts that um that are sustainable. And so in in taking those boxes, like we're winning. And um yeah, and and um yeah, I guess that's about it, really. I have a quick follow-up question about your plant-based packaging. Can you tell us a little bit? Yeah, about that? yeah. It took took ages. It took us about three years to get to this solution. Um, mm -hmm. so when we our first packaging that we had, yeah, and it was um it was plastic stand-up pouches, and it had a clear window, and that was when we thought the government was recycling, as they told us, and then we realized it wasn't, and and um, wow, I was pretty gutted because I pretty much can't sleep at night thinking that plastic, you know, oil-based plastics, plastics, petrochemical plastic from our packaging would be going to the landfill. So um, yeah, we just went off on this path and no one else was was doing it. So it was kind of an took a lot of time and research, but we just kept at it. And um, so our, I'll be totally honest. So our original plastic packaging, it cost 40 cents a unit to make. And and at the end of the three years, we got down this path that we had found um, a New Zealand company that had similar stand-up pouch and we got the quote for it and it was $1.80. So it was going to go from 40 cents to $1.80, which was just not an expense that we could absorb and not an expense we would ever consider passing on to the consumer. And we pretty much cried, like we were really, really gutted. And because um, to us, it just meant that it wasn't possible. It wasn't something we could afford to do. And um, no joke, like two days later, we got a cold call from a family owned box company down in Greymouth. And he's like, you know, I'm coming to Nelson. Can I meet up with you for half an hour? And I was like, yeah. And it was this younger guy and he walked in and he's like, we've got an idea for you guys. And it was exactly what we'd been picturing. And he just walked in with this awesome um, kind of a stand up box. And um, he's like, I think this will work for you guys. And it's, you know, it's FSC, it's recycled, it's recyclable at the curb. And so um, it's completely plant-based. And then we use the cellulose liner that we get from Australia, but just knowing the boxes themselves are from gray mouth is pretty awesome. And um, yeah. And so we're just kind of evolving our, our packaging next month we're going to get is we're actually going to be able to have a window again. So you can see what's in the product, which is really important to us. 
um, yeah, but it, it was quite a journey. And so the packaging we have now is 80 cents. So it, it did double, but it, it made it possible and, and viable for us to continue with, with a sustainable packaging option. But we, um, as sustainable as our packaging is, we still are quite thoughtful in, in having other solutions like our, our bulk, you know, we try to reuse our, our 20 liter containers. So we sell like eight, eight kilos of yum bulk into hospitality and wholesale that way. So we just keep this circular refill solution going on. Um, Cause for us, the ultimate solution is to, to not have any packaging, but obviously we're granola. So you need, you need something to consume it. But um, yeah, so anyways, that's kind of been our, our packaging journey. It's a work in progress. But. Also, we have a similar thing going with our salad mix into restaurants and we, we just keep refilling the boxes and they return them washed. And um, we also did a journey into compostable packaging for lettuce, um, which is probably a bit cheaper than what you've, you've been doing, but it's made in New Zealand too and fully home compostable. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, packaging is a we'll leave that whole subject matter for another for another time because it is it's a it's a minefield um but it, it's really interesting because we're all the whole sector has to think about it has to think about pack, packaging on a global scale so thank you both for your contributions there uh jenny i wanted to talk about there was, there was a recent article that compared locally grown veggie organic veggie boxes to supermarkets and the boxes came in better or equal in terms of price um is it possible to serve your local community and make a living from growing veggies and how can we encourage the next generation of market gardeners and small scale farmers to do this because it's got to be sustainable for for the producers and i think you're showing us the way but can you shed some light on how you're doing it Sure. Um, it's still something I'm trying to prove to myself <laughs> and to prove to my husband as well. Um, it's tough, especially this last season has been really tough. You know, you're at the mercy of the of the weather. Um, yeah, I was definitely at a point of almost burnout by December just from all the rain and um, had to pick myself up um, and just go on a holiday. And you know, like it's definitely not easy. You've got to, it's, it, you don't do it for the money, I have to say. Um, you do it because you have passion and you believe that this is important. And, um, is, is, and if you can make a, an income that will sustain your family, and in our case, that, that's money and vegetables, um, <laughs> then um, it's worth it. I mean, I'm not gonna sell it to anyone who really wants to um, be rich, because that's not why you do this, but. I feel like anything that's really worthwhile and um, is going to be hard, you know, especially if you're in a pioneering area and you have to have a bunch of skills um, to run a small business. And that includes for vegetables, you have to, if you're growing 40 or so vegetables, you have to have some skills in all of those vegetables. Um, and you have to also have skills in time, space, people and weather planning. That's a huge um, intersection of different variables. That's where statistics come in, comes in handy. Maybe a background in statistics, but in spreadsheets, but but also um, so all of those things, those skills, that conviction, that passion. Uh, it, it it narrows it down to a specific demographic of the kind of person that can that can do this. And um, and for those people, mm -hmm. I think um, we need to link up with them and provide a better extension service. Um, so I know Owens is working on this, um, and I think it's the key ingredient, uh, for, for this kind of thing that we're doing this local diversified organic market gardening or orcharding, um, upskilling is tricky because you just have to know someone, you have to be able to find someone who can tell you this, that, the other thing, um, share the knowledge. Where do we get the best, um, mycorrhizal fungi roots, shoots and fruits. And, um, you know, like you just you just talk between each other um, and then you share the knowledge but you know if you don't know that you should be inoculating with mycorrhizal fungi then you might not be as successful so um, there's a farmer extension need to 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 help really grow the local food um, economy here and the organic how to do it organically um, there's also probably scope for we need to do micro loans for young people to get involved it doesn't actually cost a huge amount 
say compared with setting up a cafe or a manufacturing business, it doesn't cost a huge amount to set up a growing business if you have a piece of land that you're allowed to use. Um, but you do need some set up capital. So we can encourage people that way. Um, and I know that most farms, small farms worldwide are run by women on micro capital and micro loans, and they make a huge difference to communities, huge difference. So, and most businesses will be small. So, and we need to recognize the importance of that in, in um, climate resilience and, and local community resilience. If you've got a food grower in your community and you're cut off, then you have some security there. So we need to, we need to focus on the small side as well as um, big companies who are making a difference. Um, yeah, I think those two things, farmer extension and microloans um, are, you know, how to do it and the means by which you do it will be really important in supporting local, local organic growing. Thanks, Jenny. I'm looking at Tiff and Tiff's looking at me, so I'll just quickly jump in. <laughs> what we're going to do now is going to open up the whole panel to a whole, um, get it, everyone on the panel to answer some kind of wider, uh, more generic questions. And um, Tiff, you were going to start us off with the first question. Do you want to start? Yes. Off, start Let's, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think um, I get asked this certain times too. and. And I thought it would be a great icebreaker for everybody to kind of talk about, you know, what are the challenges you have encountered as a female leader? Uh, this is something that I think, um, yeah, it'd be really great for us to discuss, um, especially in celebrating International Women's Day and looking at how we can forge ahead as female leaders. So please just jump in when you... Uh, when you've got something to say. <laughs> oh, should, should we start off with Molly? <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, well, for me, you know, in the agri-business agri type sector um, of, of growing, it really is a male-dominated area. And, and so, you know, there's always women in the background, in the background of farming, but they sort of were not up the front. And so I, I never really got to speak to many women. And I, and I think... Really, for me, it was quite lonely at times. And also, um, possibly I was not taken seriously at times. I do remember um, having a meeting with a corporate grower who, you know, I thought was a great meeting. After, after we shook hands and thought, okay, well, that was great. And, and then I learned about a week later that um, the person had actually asked someone else whether they knew where I'd parked my spaceship. So... <laughs> <laughs> I definitely not sure that I was always taken seriously. Yeah, and that could be a problem. Mm. What are, what's it like now? Now that times have changed, and, and how do you manage that? Well, it's interesting because um, that particular person that they had the meeting with now grows organically and uses most of our products. So <laughs> you know, time does change, and I think now you know there's a we're really on the cusp of change here, and it's. It's really exciting. Um, I think that finally, you know, we, we started so many years ago and I think timing's everything really. And um, now everyone sort of is interested in learning and especially with the way, you know, what happened in the just the last few weeks with weather conditions, it's been horrific. And I think it really is coming to the forefront that farmers need to change what they're doing. and. And sure, women can definitely be out there and, you know, we're all well-educated and why not? So, yeah, go for it. What about you, Sarah? Um, oh, that's a lot of, there's a lot of challenges. Um, being a woman, um, I don't think I appreciated women and mothers until being one. So having a, a four and a half year old in the household is is challenging in its own right. But um, but for the business, um. I guess I've always struggled to connect with like, say, supermarket buyers because, you know, 90% of them at least are men and it's the men male dominated industry. And I didn't really put it down to being a woman because I, I try to take a lot of ownership about my delivery and my communication. And so I always think that I can do a better job, but there is just this a bit of unspoken, um, I guess, I guess um, they just have natural rapport with, with 
one another with so men coming in to sell other men things is a lot easier than a woman coming in and, and just having respect and sometimes I don't think it's it's spoken or I don't even know if they are conscious of their um that they come off as not having the same amount of respect but um but I feel it's there and um and I still feel like I could do better to own it but like after last year and speaking out um about the supermarket sector I got a lot more more um, open respect from men in that industry and even in the supermarket industry because um, I guess no one else had the balls to do it. And so that made them feel more like I was one of their own. <laughs> but sometimes I've just been tempted to hire a man to go in and do it for me because why should I struggle? Why don't I just, if that's, you know, why don't I just hire someone to go in and do that part for me? And and maybe that would be a simple solution, but um, I don't know. Can always improve. I feel like. How about you, Jenny? Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's a bit of a hard question to answer because I, I don't feel like I've had many uh, challenges specifically because I'm a woman. I I come from a generation that where I went through school and they did a lot to support girls and. I got scholarships for girls and I got a lot of encouragement. I went to a girls high school. I have an amazing husband who shares duties in the household and with the business and with the kids um, equally. And he did everything except for breastfeeding, you know, so he's, he's, he's awesome. He's packing for our holiday right now. He's looking after the kids cooking, you know? Um, so I come from a, well, you know, a, a pretty good background. I would have to say though, that probably the only thing I've noticed is that, if you're an assertive woman, which I definitely am, um, you that gets sometimes taken as rudeness or pushiness or, you know, worse words than that um, in a woman, whereas um, assertiveness is seen as a strength for men and, and having cut through. Um, so I think sometimes you might not be, your ideas might not be taken on as seriously because... Uh, because of that emotional response to to a woman's um, forceful opinion, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I, I guess I'm I, I've learned quite a lot from my grandmother's generation and women in that generation, and and I see how much better we have it than they did. So I'm I'm grateful for that for for the struggles that they went through to um, give us a more even playing field I'm not saying it is even uh, especially with salaries and, and wages um, still it's not even but I pay my own self now so um, I can't complain to myself yeah awesome yeah. thank you well all you three leaders have done something that I've not done and that's you've you've set up at your own business uh, and you're you're working in that business you're employing other people and you've and you've been, you know, really successful at it. And my my job's been in in businesses and across government, but it has not. And I've been entrepreneurial inside businesses, but I've never had the guts to step out and set up my own individual business like you guys have. And I just I wondered if you could share with us all, you know, what advice you have for people who want to make that step. How do you how do you do it? What are the things you want to think about when you do it? And was, and I, let's start with Sarah this time huh? okay um I'd say the most helpful thing for for us and I um and I see this with with Mike and I because we have really different backgrounds when it comes to being an entrepreneur I was I was raised by parents that were entrepreneurs they never had nine to five jobs so that was that was the example that I had and to me it's higher risk to actually work for someone else and that's that's my feelings and um, Mike is Mike is the exact opposite. So, um, yeah, as far as as far as setting it up, it's it's a matter. Um, I think in in what makes us enjoy life the most, I've noticed is um, is just a matter of expectation, and and that can just get you on the right foot or the the uncomfortable foot from the beginning. So, if you have an expectation that this is going to be yeah a quick path to retirement or an easier journey or whatever, but um, it's just to Make, to like, I guess always check in with those expectations and and to make sure that um that you're tracking with them to kind of reality and what you want to create in your reality and so um 
yeah, my, my expectations and they, and they're always changing. Right. But, um, but I, I do notice like with Mike, when his expectations shift to kind of accepting that, um, it can be challenging sometimes and, and it's a dynamically changing role all the time. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually quite a lot like parenthood. It's a matter of expectations that can make you enjoy it. Yeah. So, so setting those expectations, knowing that it's normal, not going to be smelling the roses there's going to be some work yeah. along the way yeah. yeah exactly yeah yeah how about you molly what 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 advice have you got for us oh okay so obviously be brave <laughs> and be bold and you know be a, a chameleon i know i've had to sort of become a beer swelling man at some stage you know to celebrate the wins with the blokes at the at the bar um, so be what you have to be, be prepared to work hard. I know I've worked, you know, for many, many years, I used to work till three in the morning and that was just the norm, which is really crazy. But I can say that, you know, I, like I mentioned before, we'd come into this industry quite early on, probably too early. And I think timing's everything. And, and now for someone to get into the industry and into organic industry, you know, it's, it's the perfect time. You know, it, we're on the cuffs of change here um, and I think you know there's so many tools available now the new technologies it, it just makes life so much easier to do things I remember people used to ring me and say you know living on Waiheke oh I suppose you're down at the beach typing or something and of course I wasn't but now I can be right <laughs> so you can have your kids playing on the beach and still be working you know, you, you, there's different ways of doing things these days. And so I think just grab it by the horns and, and go and do it and be prepared to, to move quickly with the times and change, change quickly. Everyone had to pivot with COVID, you know, and it's just life. You need to learn to pivot and make those changes. And I think if you can do that, then go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really just changing direction and and, and systems and direction and technology, technology, <laughs> technology agile. hard work, yeah. <laughs> having a good work ethic is, you know, yeah. really important yeah. because yeah, um, yeah. as Jenny said, it takes a while before you actually get to a position where you can employ people and take time off and feel confident that everything's going to go fine. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so Jenny, you talked about a bit about you know some of the things that would be good to have, like small um, uh, grants for small growers and uh, the you know the extension programs and all that sort of thing. But what about the inside of the your a brain of somebody who's about to embark on a similar business to you? What do what what advice do you have on that side? Yeah, um, I really reinforce what the other two said. Um, expectations are you know you've got to actually expect that you'll succeed <laughs> you've got to have that and that comes with being brave you, you've got to have that belief in yourself um but also you can't get too attached to things that's the yogic approach right um mm. you know do what you can do the best you can and then leave the rest to um, the universe so um you have to be ready to change your approach if, if you can get that feedback that it's not working um my, my contribution to how to set up a, a business would be uh, you need to get some planning in place at first, you know, um, but don't be hamstrung by your own planning. So I know plenty of people who've planned and planned and planned and never done anything because they didn't like their plan. Um, so they got, they got freaked out by their own plan. Um, what your business plan's not perfect. Oh, you can't do it. No, that's not how you've got to, it's, it's a, it's a, it's like your crop plan. You plan to grow certain things in a certain order, in a certain place, but then the weather wreaks havoc and you have to change your crop plan because that didn't work out. Um, so you have to be flexible, but you do have to have that planning step. Um, one important part of your plan is identifying your market. That's the key thing, I think, in the beginning is like, what are you going to, what are you doing? Where is your market? Um, who's going to buy your product? Is there a demand for it? And um, I think... If, we're in a fortunate position in the organic um, sector that there is a market for it. And there is, I'd have to say in the seven years we've been running <clears throat> our little market garden, I don't think we've ever met demand at this point, you know, so production, 
has been the problem, not meeting the demand, you know, like having enough production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. One thing I would add too, to this, I, I like Sarah, I grew up with entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and it's like the only way of moving forward in life, it seems in my family. And, um, I am like, I felt like for a while as the queen of failures, I kept, I, I failed so many times in lots of different, um, you know, with lots of different ideas or, or, or not being there at the right time and, and the right place. And, and, you know, being a little bit too, just, just not really measuring up to what the consumer, you know, demand was for that product. But I'm, I'm a person that's got a lot of ideas. But one of the things I've had to learn is to accept your failures and, and acknowledge and truly believe that it's okay to fail and be able to pivot beyond that and let it go and let it not creep in and sort of take over and, and sterilize you from being able to move forward. So that's the only thing I would really add. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, never, oh, got, oh, go ahead, Sarah. I was just going to say, um, sometimes I've gotten stalled out in just um, being overwhelmed because I am always quite accepting of the fact that um, there's so many unknowns to us, you know, of, like you you open one jar and there's another unknown and then you just keep opening. And so sometimes it's just quite overwhelming that we don't know what we want to know, you know, and then, the, then there's the saying, you know, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And so that can be quite daunting sometimes. And um, and then I realized, I don't know, I just had this point that I got to that I realized like, there's actually a lot of knowns. Like, I believe in myself. I believe in our product. I believe, you know, I believe in our ability to learn. I be believe in our ability to be agile and pivot. Like you start just making a list of what you do believe in and then what you, the unknowns kind of become just something you accept to to broaden and learn more about, but they don't stall you out. Does that make sense? Uh, and I was going to say also, I think you can structure your business the way you want. So if you've got kids, you know, involve them in what you're doing, no matter what it is, whether it's answering the phone or planting veggies or whatever. And also knowing what you want or knowing what you want and also having a plan of how you want to leave the business, you know, is, is, are you setting up the business for family to go on with in life, your children, or are you wanting to sell the business? I think that's really important when you're planning a business to set up a business is to actually keep the end in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That succession planning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey Viv, I think we have um, time for one more question. Do you want to, you've got a one question that I think would be really great to ask. Um, our participants. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, so all these women that, that are up here today, they've all made stands in their own ways uh, to help social change. So uh, Yum, she, um, Sarah's kind of, alluded to it, made a really public stand uh, um, again, about supermarkets and the, the way that they uh, manipulate promotions and charging for their own benefit, you know, something that we're all pretty familiar with. Um, Molly has been really good on the whole regenerative agriculture advocacy space. And Jenny, we've heard about all her work on on boards, um, working with the Organics Products Bill, etc. So they're all not just working on their own businesses, but they're working for social change as well. And I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity and ask each of you how you kind of integrate that social change into your business and, and why you've decided to go down that path. Sarah, should we start with you? Okay. Just because you're in the middle of the screen. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I ever had a choice, but I guess I'm not, we always have choices, right, of what we comment or speak about. But um, I guess I just felt really um, in defense of the consumer. And um, if I wasn't the owner of a business that supplied supermarkets, I would have just assumed that the suppliers dictate pricing. And so I guess in wanting to be, I want to see a more transparent model. And to me, that was our contribution so the consumer can make more educated choices. But um, yeah, 
yeah, I guess we're a, we really are a value driven business. It's what's kept us in business. It's what kept us, it's like our GPS. It's what's kept us tracking through COVID and, and growing as we do. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just who we are. And so when, when you are value driven and, and that's your foundation, there's no other option. And you have a loud American as a founder that happens to speak her opinion. <laughs> awesome Sarah thank you what about you Jenny well um I, I could like Sarah I just feel like um I'm on a path I can't stop it I I have values I I live them um how do I incorporate them in my business or why do I well I, I wanted to be doing something with my life that was addressing the climate crisis and and I want to um, also be doing something with my life that I enjoyed so those two things growing food intersected with that in a way that um, makes for a, a lifestyle that suits me um, I think we're in a really critical stage of earth's development here and um, we need to recognize that things have to change and uh, so I, I wanted to be able to sort of show myself that that I could run a business that 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 did that you know that provided for my community food in a way that um, was healthy and, and climate friendly. And um, I guess what I wanna do is encourage others to, to take the same journey and, to, and I wanna help them along the way as much as possible as well. Um, so getting involved with soil and health, um, you know, when I was shoulder tapped by Stephen Browning actually, um, who I know through Green Party involvement, um, so he he was like, you'd probably be the per the right person to to spearhead something um, for us because you can you you're in that generation that's um you know you're in a different generation and and you're you you're there to show middle aged and young people starting businesses that they can um that they can do it in in a in a way that's organic and you know creates I guess um change in that way and soil and health is such a great platform for that because it's so old and and respected and it has a wonderful magazine and um it's like a community in itself that is the oldest organic community i guess group um in the world um i think maybe along with or alongside the new zealand biodynamic association um so yeah i yeah, just like Sarah, I feel like I'm just driven to do it. Um, sometimes it feels a bit um, mad, you know, everyone could be, I could be making more money doing other things with my with my degree and, and all the rest of it, but I'm not necessarily driven by that, although I do feel like it's an important aspect and it's something I'd like to, like the, the actual profitability of this, this model of growing, something that I'd like the government to recognize a little bit more at the importance of, and I would like supermarkets to have less sway, just like Sarah. <laughs> Um, they're an important distribution channel for for um, many goods, but they shouldn't be the only thing that we're depending on. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Molly, do you want to close us out? Okay, then. Thank you. <laughs> so for us, um, you know, we, we like to do things in a quiet way. I suppose it's just our personality and... So for us, you know, being part of the change. So if people are out planting trees and there's tree planting days, we rock up with the shovel and mycorrhizal fungi and we tend to, you know, just give stuff away to a lot of people just so that we're educating all the time. Um, and and I, I think also one of the, we need to find ways or we've been trying to find ways to speak to more people um, without doing that quietly and, and so for us, um, developing a market market garden range was important. Um, I think in a country like New Zealand, it's small enough that everyone in Auckland or wherever sort of has a, fa a, a you know a family member or a friend that's a farmer, and and so by sort of you know shouting out, there's new ways of doing things to all these. Um, people in Auckland or wherever they might be, they then in turn hopefully spread the good news. And so we we try and do it in a little bit more undercover. We're a bit more chameleon. We've, we've tried the more head-on approach and that didn't work. So, yeah, we, we're always looking for ways to, to do things quietly, I suppose. 
Well, thank you, Molly. I have to say this has been an amazing um, conversation and I have to thank all of our panelists and, and for Viv for coming along today. You've taught us so much. I definitely want to do a lot more of these. This has been great. I have a list of um, ideas for future webinars too. So uh, we'll get you back in and, and have some more discussions. And I wanted to thank all the attendees for joining us today. It's been really, really great having you here and participating in our in our conversations. And I want to say that OANS is, um, we're hoping to do these monthly webinars, but for the next couple of months, we're actually going to switch our regular schedule from the third Thursday of every month. And we're going to have April and May's back to back. Um, our next webinar is during Organic Week, which is the first through um, the first through the seventh of May. Um, so make sure you're you're getting in touch with Lou, talking about Organic Week. You've got your ears up, your your mind reading a lot of the activities that are going on on the Organic Week website and um, through OAN's comms channels as well. Because we want to make sure that we're raising awareness for the sector and celebrating all the good work that everyone's doing. This is our this is our week to really shine. So make sure you get involved in that too. And um, on that note, thank you so much for coming along and we look forward to seeing you uh, on our, in our during Organic Week. Thank, thank you everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks Lou and Tiff. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Right, how do we close this down? Hey, Lou. Yeah. I didn't take a photo of the screenshot. Sorry, I just saw your comment. I'm just going to stop the video. Bear with me. <laughs>